take a look at this animation. It looks good, doesn't it? We have this expanding ball of spheres with a certain distribution which evolves as it grows with more spheres and... Okay, now you're just showing off. But what if I told you that this entire animation is just spheres and this massive equation? And this controls the entire thing. Well, that's true, and in this video we'll build up this function, creating a function which takes a couple of properties of the final sphere and is returning the position and the existence of the ball, which for a single ball might not seem like a lot, but once you add enough of them, creates the animation. So how will we do it? Okay, so first things first, how do we make a sphere of spheres? Well, technically we could just take the UV sphere and distribute points of faces, but this isn't a Blender video, it's a math video. So instead I'll just make a bunch of spheres like so. Now, you can't see it, but in that spot there, there's actually 300 spheres. So how do we put them in the shape of a ball? Well, here are the tools we'll need. First, a random function. Whenever we use it, this function will return a random number between a lower B and a higher B. So it will return a random number from this range outlined in purple. This kind of function may seem like a mathematical oddity, but if we just take all the spheres and index them from 0 to 299, then save those spheres and we put them back in, then a simple random function could look like this. I'll explain how it works later on, but for now all you need to know is that once we give this function a seed, the lower boundary and the upper boundary, then it returns a random number in our region. Now, this function could also work for vectors, and we could even create multiple functions if we need multiple random numbers, but before I demonstrate what it means, let's get to the second tool we'll need, the position of the sphere. So this is even simpler, each ball has its own three-dimensional vector describing its position. The more right it goes, the higher the x, the more forward it goes, the higher the y, and the more up it goes, the higher the z. Now from this we could already have some fun, if we set the y to 0 for example, and if we set the x to a random number, and the z to the same random number squared, then what we get is a nice parabola. And by now I think you should understand how it works, and if you don't, then just keep watching the video, I mean. So with that in mind, let's get back to the problem of how to make a sphere. I'll give you a second to think about it. Okay, got it? Well, first we'll just try plugging in a random vector for our positions, and what we get is... a cube. Now, this makes a lot of sense once you realize that we have the lower boundary and the upper boundary for each direction, and our randomness just picks a random vector in between. So, what do we need to do to get the sphere? Well, if you think about it, then on a sphere, every single point is just as far away from the middle as any other point. Which means that what we actually need to do is just take a random vector and check the distance from the center. We can do it with a single Pythagorean, and then just divide every single vector by that distance. There. Behold a sphere. And so we've done it. The first chapter of the video is behind us. We've got a function which turns a single ID number and turns it into a coordinate on a sphere. Which means that we can start with the first ball with ID equal to 0 and align it to a position. Next we have another sphere with ID equal to 1 and align it to a position. And then ID 2, ID 3, and it just keeps going. There. A sphere. Next we have the... So first let's start with something simple. Let's attach a scalar multiplier. Now with this scalar multiplier we can make the sphere larger or smaller. That's great, now what about the funky shape? Well for the funky shape we'd need to add one more dimension to our vector, and that's the existence. What the existence will do is if the sphere is below zero, it won't exist. If it's above 1, however, it will exist. That's as simple as it could be. Now with our function, in order to achieve those funky shapes, we'd like to set the existence of as many of those in the middle to 1, and as we go outer and outer, we'd like it to get closer and closer to 0. So how would we do it? Well, in order to understand that, let's take a look at a completely unrelated e to the x. Wait, how is that useful? We'll get that in a second, but first let me ask you another question. How to make this symmetric? So for example, if you want the right side of this graph to become the mirror copy of the left, then how would you achieve that? 
Well, the left side is the negative side, so a simple way to achieve that would be just take the absolute value and make it negative. That way, going left to right numbers would go negative 2, negative 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2. Meaning that our new function would look like this, because the x would be negative on the left and on the right, making it symmetric. And that's not bad, but the sharp peak down the middle is a bit annoying. Can we somehow get rid of it? And as a matter of fact, yeah, we can. Squaring the x will do the trick, and there, there we go. Now since a second has passed, how could we use this graph to modify our shape? Well, we can't use the graph, instead we need to use the underlying function. So if we take our function and plug z as the input, so how high or how low our points are, then this function will start near zero, go up and up and up and up, until it starts falling down again, which is exactly what we need. So we take our new function and plug that into our four-dimensional vector, and there we go. We've got the funky shape sphere we wanted. But now, how would we transition between just the sphere and the funky one? Hello everyone and welcome to my transitioning tutorial. And today we'd like to transition from this sphere to this one. So how would we do it? Well, first let's imagine a slider of transition. So how much we've transitioned. At zero, we'd like it to just be the sphere. And at one, we'd just like it to be the funky. And at half, we'd like it to be, well, half the sphere, half the funky, so how would we do it? Well, that's simple. At zero, we just need to plug in one, because if the existence of everything is one, then we get a sphere. It's equally existent everywhere. At one, we'd like to plug in our fancy Gaussian function, but what about 0 0.5? Well, at 0 0.5, we'd like to plug in half of one, plus half the Gaussian, like this. I don't think I need to explain much there, we're just combining the half of one and half of the other, but what about 0 0.25? Well, at 0 0.25, we'd like 0 0.25 of the Gaussian, and to fill in the gaps, 0 0.75 of the one, and then we just add them together again. At 0 0.75, the same thing except the other way, and there. So what we're basically trying to do is we're trying to find an equation which would work for all of these examples. So what kind of equation would work there? Well, the higher our transition number, the higher this number right here, but at the same time, the lower the transition number, the higher this number right here. So a simple way to fix it would be just plug our positive transition number, and here multiply it by a negative. But there is a problem. Right here we'd like to start with our number being equal to 1, and only then for it to get smaller and smaller, but that's actually a simple fix. We start with 0, so instead we just add 1, and there. Uh, now we've got a simple number, and it works. Now you can see that our equation from the very bottom to the very top is equal to the equation we've created, which is a proper good sign that our equation works perfectly well for transitioning between our spheres and the funky. Next, after transitioning, there is... Now for this one, we'd like our ball to change as it grows, which is totally fine, it happens to all of us, and is totally normal. Well, it doesn't really happen to me, considering how I'm a eternal being of pure information. But for you mortals, yeah, I'm sure. So let's say that we'd like our ball to change as it grows. How do we achieve that? A simple way could be to just plug in the size of our sphere. Remember the size? We got it from the scaling earlier on. In here and there. Fixed. Except there is a problem. Well, a bunch of problems actually, but I'll focus on one for now, and that's the fact that as our sphere gets larger and larger, the Gaussian stays the same. Which means that with our equation, as the sphere gets larger, the part of the sphere selected by the Gaussian gets relatively smaller and smaller. So how do we fix it? Well, here's where we get to the fun bit of the video, the how we modify function segment. Wow, it only took us almost... 10 minutes to get here! <laughs> and so to understand that, let's imagine a number line on a grid with some arbitrary function f of x. Let's add the numbers, all the grades, all the negative 3, the negative 2, the negative 1, all the way up to 3. Now let's consider how us changing the function will affect it. And here I gotta be brutally honest with you, I just realized that this way of visualizing it will be borderline impossible to animate. And that's why let me just quickly um, switch to this arbitrary function. 
Listen, I'm making these videos alone and I upload once every five days, all right? I have a pretty solid excuse for doing it. So you've already seen one of these transforms and that's the absolute value of X. The absolute value there will cause numbers on the left to become the numbers on the right, which is equivalent to us copying the right side of the function to the left. That's because this dot right here is so high up because that's what we get when we plug in three into our function. So if we take the absolute value of X, then both sides have a free on it, and so both sides become symmetric. This will be different from if we took the absolute value of the entire function, in which case the function itself would just be above zero. Next we have addition. What happens if we add a constant to the x? Something like 2.5 let's say. Well all the numbers will become more positive, or in other words it would be equivalent to us pushing the function left. That's because the spot where we previously had our 3 is now at 2.5, and the spot where we previously had 0 0.5, we now have a 3. This is different from if we added c to the function itself, because then the entire function would just move up or down. And then last, let's multiply the x by c. Now if we set it to 3, you can see that the logic is similar to addition, except this time we're moving it in both directions at the same time otherwise known as stretching it. If we decrease c to a much lower number, then we shrink it, and once again, we multiply the entire function, we get something like this. So as a quick recap, TLDR basically is, multiplying is stretching and shrinking, addition is moving, and doing it to the x versus the function is the difference between doing it on the x-axis versus the y-axis. And so with that in mind, we can get back to the Gaussian, so, what would we like to do? Well, we'd like to stretch it on the z-axis, and we'd like to stretch it more and more the larger the sphere, so we'd like to multiply it by the inverse of the size. Or in other words, divided by the size. Simple. And so there, now we have a sphere which starts like a sphere of balls, and then turns into this more complicated shape. Now it's just time for the last touches. And so now, to finish up, we'd like to do two things. First of all, we'd like our sphere to flatten once it reaches a certain point, and this is actually trivially easy. Basically, we have two functions here. Our entire function we've defined so far, so, you know, this four-dimensional vector, and then the same exact function, except the x-coordinate is just a constant to make it flat. So we have two functions which we'd like to mix, but how? will allow me to introduce you to the sine function, which is simple enough. Every negative number returns a negative one, every positive number returns a positive one, and zero... We, we don't talk about the zero. So this function would work great for mixing the way we mix the sphere with the Gaussian before, except it's a bit messy, so let's clean it up. First of all, instead of negative one and positive one, we'd prefer from zero to positive one like we had before, so that's pretty simple. Just add one to our sign to move it up and divide it by two to flatten it. Simple. Now we just use the combining method from before and there we go, we got the flattening function. Now all we need to do is just move it left or right, which you've already seen how to do, and there we have our mixing function which we can move. But there is something interesting going on there. You see, we would like to mix between these two functions, but this constant and this constant can be different. Which means if we set them in a way in which the mixing function is much further, but the barrier is much closer, we could have an animation like this. But that's not really what we like. Instead, we would like them both to be the same constant, because then this is what the animation looks like. Now, if we move the sphere left, it hits the screen flat. Lovely. Now the second thing would be this question of how do we add more spheres? And to do that, first we have to do... nothing! That's it, we've already done everything! We've created a function that takes a point index, and based on the size of the sphere, shift to the right, and the distance to the flat screen, creates the x, y, z position and the existence. Which means that we can calculate this function for a single point like this, or maybe the same exact thing for 200 points, just with different IDs. Or maybe 5,000. Or maybe a thousand like this, but then also a thousand with a smaller scale, a thousand with a smaller scale, and so on and so forth. It's 
And there we have it, we've reached the point of this video. Because the point of this video is that this is what the geometry nodes responsible for this animation look like. Here I create a thousand points, set all of them to be spheres, and that's kind of it. Just take our function and set the position as position, take the existence and set that as the scale. But the true magic happens inside the function, which looks like this. Scary, isn't it? Well, it shouldn't be. Because all of these nodes is what we've gone over in this video. And that's the point. Math functions really often look terrifying with this kind of scale, and when you set them up with math notation, it really gets massive. But that's only because here I've compressed the meaning of every operation, every decision, and every method into a single block. And if you go through it step by step, it actually makes a lot of sense and becomes kind of obvious. And so there, that's the function explained. If you'd like to know why this sphere of balls looks the way it does, I would re-suggest this video about firing lasers at ions to then get set an electron distribution. And a spoiler, yeah, this is the, it's supposed to be the electrons. But for now, that is the entire thing explained. And so, with the- Oh, damn it, I forgot about the random function from the beginning of the video. Oh, well, it's been five days. I need to upload this video because otherwise I won't have enough money to pay my rent. Uh, I would especially like to thank my patrons for supporting me because otherwise I really wouldn't be able to pay my rent. YouTube does not pay well for small creators. Especially like to thank Acronymous, Useless, Quasar and Lakebear for supporting with the highest patron tier. And I would like to thank Positron for this lovely art. I mean, it, it truly is lovely. I stream every single day for charity and I have Discord Patreon, you know the deal. For now, that'll be it. Thank you everyone so much for watching and have a great day. Bye.